Hi. Today I have a little bit of a rant about EEPROMs and programmers and debugging and making assumptions. So if that's interesting for you, listen up. I've got a little bit of a story to tell. So here we've got my P65 breadboard computer. It's pretty much in the same state it was at the end of my last video. And at that point, I'd gotten the expansion board working the way that I wanted to. And uh, the next thing I wanted to do was just to update the firmware for the system th so that the expansion board would get properly uh, reset into a good uh, state when the system resets itself. And in order to do that, I needed to update the uh, firmware. Now, the firmware in this system is this uh, EEPROM right here. This is a 28C65. It's an eight kilobyte uh, electrically erasable programmable ROM. And when I first built the Project 65 computer, these were pretty easy to get a hold of. I think I got mine from DigiKey or Mouser or someplace like that. Uh, they've gotten a lot more scarce in recent years, but I think you can still find them on eBay if you need to. That scarceness is kind of a concern for me because I do only have one of these things and uh, this chip has already been plugged into the uh, breadboard backwards on at least one occasion. Obviously, any time you want to update the firmware, you need to take it out, put it into the programmer, then stick it back in when you're done, and accidents happen. One time I got it in backwards and I didn't even realize what I had done until I started to smell uh, burning plastic. Surprisingly, once everything had cooled down and I uh, turned the chip back around, uh, it still worked. So that was good news. But after that, I decided that I wanted to make sure that I didn't take this thing out of the, uh, out of the P65 breadboard any more often than I absolutely had to. And in order to facilitate that, I added the ability to update the firmware while it was still in place here. So I added a write protect switch uh, right here. Uh, in one position, the write enable for the EEPROM is uh, tied directly to plus five volts. And in the other, it gets the same write enable signal that I use for the, uh, for the RAM and for writing to the expansion bus that I talked about extensively last time. And then I wrote a little program that could download a new uh, firmware image over Z modem and write it to the EEPROM. And most of the time that works just fine. Now, if you uh, mess up and the firmware is not good, you're going to brick the machine and then you need to uh, take the EEPROM out and program it the old fashioned way. And that's what happened with my first attempt to update the, uh, the firmware uh, this last time. I made a small mistake. It was actually in the linker configuration file. And as a result, everything in the EEPROM was sort of positioned a few bytes off from where it was supposed to be. So once I got it updated and reset the system, nothing happened. I had, yeah, I had thoroughly bricked it. Now that was a pretty easy mistake to fix. It wasn't a big deal and it actually was kind of an opportunity for me because I had recently updated my EEPROM programmer and I hadn't really had a chance to use the new version in practice. So here's the new one. Uh, this new version, this is uh, something I put together myself just using an Arduino and uh, a couple of uh, 23017 port expanders and just a ZIF socket. The first version I did of this was just uh, put together on a breadboard. This is my first attempt at making a PCB, so I kept it very, very simple. Uh, I had actually gotten the PCBs back in November and uh, assembled this thing and did some basic testing. I put an EEPROM in it and I made sure that I could write to it and that I could read the same thing back out that I wrote to it. So it all seemed like a, it all seemed like it was working properly, but I hadn't had a real chance to use it in practice yet. So I was looking forward to that. So I took the EEPROM out. I fixed my little problem with the linker config. I used this guy to write the new uh, image into the EEPROM, put it back in the machine, and it was still busted. Now, when the P65 is working correctly, when I press the reset switch here, 
you can see the LEDs here flash in a very predictable uh, pattern that I'm used to seeing. But with both of these new EEPROM images, I would get just uh, nothing or a few random flashes or a flicker. It behaved very erratically. So still not completely worried, I went back and found uh, a known good image and I flashed that into the EEPROM using the uh, using the new PCB EEPROM programmer and that one didn't work either and that was when I started to get a little bit worried. Now you can kind of tell that the EEPROM is kind of stuck deep into a nest of wiring here and so the first thing I thought was that maybe when I was pulling it out and putting it back in something had come loose. Uh, something had gotten jarred, maybe something was shorted together, maybe, you know, this breadboard is 12 years old and maybe something was just a little bit corroded, didn't have a good connection, maybe I had messed something up that way. And I ended up spending many hours over the course of two days trying to check all these connections, make sure everything was solid, make sure all these cables were well in place, make sure everything was going where it in was intended to, and I couldn't find anything wrong, but nothing I did seemed to have any impact. I spent a lot of time looking at the contents of the data bus during a reset, where I should have been able to see the uh, computer reading the reset vector location, and I couldn't find that. I couldn't find the uh, address that I was expecting to see being transferred over on the uh, data bus. And I was getting very worried and a little bit confused. I wanted to probe the address bus with the, uh, with the logic analyzer, but there's not a lot of room to get any kind of connection to the address lines here anymore because the breadboard is uh, fairly complicated and has a lot of things attached and honestly is kind of a mess. So I was really getting to the point of desperation where I was thinking I was going to have to unplug uh, a fairly big chunk of this in order to maybe, maybe take the LEDs out so that I could uh, put some logic analyzer probes here in the same place to see what was happening or something like that or or take out the RAM and just run something completely from ROM so that the system was simpler and I could see what was happening. I was convinced for a very long time that the problem was with the computer itself and not with anything else. And that was an assumption and it wasn't a very good assumption. And luckily before I started disassembling things on a large scale, I, I, I paused and I asked myself, well, could the EEPROM programmer be completely broken in a way that just wasn't particularly obvious? It had been a couple of months since I had put it together and I kind of had it in my head that I had tested it and it worked, but I didn't really remember how well I had tested it or what I hadn't done to test it. And before I, before I did some major disassembly, it was a good idea to see if I could validate that somehow. But it seemed like in order to do that, I would need a, a, a second EEPROM programmer. But luckily, I kind of did have that. So this is the original breadboard version of the EEPROM programmer. Now it's had the chips, uh, the 23017s that would go here and here stripped out of it, but uh, to put into the PCB version. Now, when I built the PCB one, I was going to recycle this breadboard. I just hadn't gotten around to it yet. I'd shoved it in a drawer and I hadn't needed it yet. Well, that was very convenient because I was able to get this board up and running again very quickly and try writing an EEPROM image with it. And uh, yeah, everything started to work. Everything was fixed which meant that this guy had to be the source of the problem. The computer was fine, but the EEPROM programmer was doing the wrong thing.
So is it possible for this to have had an error where it could write an image to an EEPROM, read the data back and get the same, get the exact same results that it was expecting, but the resulting EEPROM would behave badly when written into, uh, when being read from another system? Well, yeah, actually, there are a variety of ways that that could happen. If you juxtaposed a couple of the data lines, for example, everything be written incorrectly, but when you tried to read it back, the flipped bits would be unflipped. So with that in mind, it was time to go back to the, uh, to the schematics. And because I was looking for it, it jumped out at me right away. The problem is right here with the uh, HGPIO pins that are tied to the, uh, the least significant byte of the address bus. And quite simply, they are hooked up backwards from the way that I intended. Here the actual pin numbers are 0 through 7, top to bottom. Here they're 0 through 7, bottom to top. Now. This isn't inherently wrong. These are general purpose IO pins. You can hook them up in whatever order you wanted to, but they are backwards from the order that I intended and they are backwards from the order that the software that I wrote was expecting, which meant that the, uh, uh, the EEPROM image that ended up getting written to the ROM was completely scrambled. Luckily, this is the sort of problem that you can actually work around in software, which is what I've done for now. So here in the Arduino program, all I had to do was go into this function that sets the value on the address bus and add these three lines that takes the uh, value in the lower byte of the address register and just uh, switches around the order of the individual bits. And once I did this, the PCB version of the EEPROM programmer is working just fine. This is a little awkward to have to do it in software. Performance-wise, it doesn't actually make any significant difference, but it just looks kind of ungainly. So next time I do a revision of the PCB, I'll probably actually fix this. But for now, I, I think this is good enough. One final thing I wanted to mention is that I've been trying to get most of the code for these projects put up into a uh, set of GitHub repositories, and I'll put a link to these down in the description. But I'll just mention uh, all of the code and the schematics and uh, a, a picture of the uh, layout for the breadboard version of the EEPROM programmer are here. Uh, a lot of the code for the Project 65 computer is here. This includes the uh, uh, the OS image, the uh, in situ program for updating the firmware, uh, and a few other programs. Uh, no schematics in here yet, but I intend to get some made up and, and put in here uh, if you're interested in that. So uh, stay tuned for that. I also want to mention after this particularly chaotic sort of update, some of my plans for the Project 65 computer. I now, it turns out that the breadboard stability issues really haven't been a problem. I just got kind of misled by my own uh, assumptions, and that's okay, I suppose. But long term, I do want to do something to make sure that the project is going to be stable and working long into the future. And so I am looking into designing some PCBs for it and getting those built up. I'm not quite at the point yet where I want to do that. I need a little bit more practice with PCB making, and I need to do a, a couple of minor changes to the design, so that'll probably be coming up in the near future too. Just a few changes uh, for convenience and to put things how I want them before it becomes more or less permanent. So stay tuned and, and we'll see how that all goes. So until next time, thanks for watching.